Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, the 11th of January, 2008, approximately 9.30 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Um, James Malcolm Brown, uh, August 11th, 1946, and I was born in uh, Troy, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? I had uh, graduated from Fort Anne Central High School in Fort Anne, New York, and uh, I had had one year of uh, aviation training at the Academy of Aeronautics in Flushing Meadows, New York. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? Um, I enlisted at, at the time I uh, joined uh, the Marine Corps wasn't drafting. Uh, as I recall, I think the first Marine Corps draftees were coming into boot camp uh, just as we were finishing up boot camp. Mm -hmm. That would have been um, uh, late 1965. Mm -hmm. So when did you go into service? Uh, October 1965 I arrived at Paris Island. Okay. Um, why did you decide to enlist and why did you pick the Marines? Uh, family background and history, primarily. Um, on the Brown side of the family, uh, I had an uncle that was uh, actually a China, what they called a China Marine okay. in World War II. He uh, did all the island hopping, etc., and was uh, uh, seriously wounded at one of the landings. Um, his brother, my father, uh, was a marine aviator. He flew at the end of World War II as a radar operator in the F-7 F Tiger Cats. And then he flew in Korea in uh, F-3D Sky Knights as a radar uh, operator. And uh, he and his uh, pilot, who was the commanding officer, went down together and were listed as missing in action until the end of the war. Okay. Um, so you went to Paris Island for basic. How long were you there? Uh, I believe training at that time was about 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And of course when we finished Paris Island, we went to uh, Camp Geiger at, at Lejeune for inf infantry training, as uh, all Marines are supposed to be riflemen. Mm -hmm. uh, then I had a little bit of uh, leave and went to Jacksonville, Florida for 22 weeks of uh, aviation electrician school. Now, did, did you enlist for that school, or did they give that to you? I wanted an aptitude? aviation guarantee, okay. uh, which I got based on testing scores. Mm -hmm. uh, what my specialty would be, they determined basically on their needs and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and slots that were open. Uh, I had hoped originally uh, to be an aircraft mechanic and maybe uh, get on helicopters and uh, gun crews and stuff. But for some reason I must have scored well enough that they sent me to the, uh, the AE school instead, mm -hmm. which, which turned out to be a, a pretty, good, pretty good deal, actually. Um, and then after that I was assigned... Uh, let, let me just ask you, what was that school like? Was there a lot of discipline like, like you had in basic training, or was it kind of a relaxed uh, school it, training type atmosphere. It was, it was semi, yeah, I would call it semi-relaxed. I mean, uh -huh. you still had to follow all the, the disciplinary uh, uh, expectations of the military, but uh, it wasn't like in boot camp. We had, you know, we were free to move around and, and, and uh, you know, go on liberty and, and stuff like that. Uh, but the course was pretty intense. The, the course was very intense, and, and it was, uh, I said it was 22 weeks, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that was just basic aviation electronics. It didn't necessarily train you for any specific aircraft. That came later when you got assigned a squadron. Okay. Now, was most of the classroom work or out in the field doing actual... Most of it was classroom work mm -hmm. uh, with mock-up boards and stuff mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and testing of, of, again, general systems. Uh, nothing real specific. When were you assigned to a, a unit? As soon as that the AE training was over, mm -hmm. um, we 
our next set of orders assigned us to a unit, mm -hmm. um, and I was sent to uh, VMA AW 533, uh, the Nighthawks at uh, North Carolina, Cherry Point. And there what was, you, it, what was this? Uh, it was called VMA AW 533, the Nighthawks. Okay. Um, the V, the VMA simply is, is a fixed wing marine mm -hmm. attack. Mm -hmm. The AW was all weather. Uh, and then uh, 533 was the unit mm -hmm. designation. Um, we immediately incorporated into the squadron for the beginnings of some on-the-job training, limited, of course, because it was a specific aircraft. Uh, the squadron then later, a uh, short time after that, uh, sent the newer people up to uh, Naval Air Station at Oceana in Virginia, Virginia Beach. And uh, we got specific training in our aircraft, which was the A6A Intruder. And when that was done, back to the squadron. How long was that training? That, I, you know, I can't remember exactly, but that wasn't real long. That was mm -hmm. more like probably six weeks or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, just specialized systems for, for our area. Uh, the Intruder was extremely complex. It was the most advanced thing they really had at the time. It involved computers and, and, and uh, a bunch of stuff. And where most previous squadrons with other aircraft had an electric or an avionics shop that did everything, the intruder was so complex that you had three distinct avionics shops. So you had an electric shop, which I was part of. You had fire control and navigation and uh, uh, in the computer section. Uh, which so was, the was fire control. Was there was there was separate. there was fire control, which was mm -hmm. computers. There was what we called com nav communication navigation. They did radios and things like that. And and then the basic electrics, which I was in, we did all the instrument systems, fuel systems, lighting, anything that wasn't computer or radio uh, involved. So we had a tremendous number of systems, autopilots, um, you know, uh, a ton of equipment on that aircraft for for basic AE. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just so complex, it took three distinct shops uh, to work on it. And so we, were you kept pretty busy? Uh, yeah, they were a high maintenance aircraft. Okay. Very good, extremely good aircraft, uh, rugged, durable, tremendous payload. Uh, two men uh, playing a, a pilot and a, a radar uh, or a bombardier navigator, they would call them. I refer back to my father as the radar operator, so it, that would have been a sort of a comparable job. But uh, uh, they flew side by side rather than one behind the other, which you see in the Phantoms, that four Phantoms, and mm -hmm. a lot of the fighters. Uh, so it was a it was a side by side aircraft, which was made it kind of unique, but very complex. Did you get to go up at all? Never got an opportunity to fly in one. I, I taxied in them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of our things was the compass system, and uh, we think of the computers, but they have a standby compass in there that has to be what we call swung and aligned mm -hmm. every now and then. And, that's done on what they call a compass rose, where you lock one wheel in and rotate the plane, and uh, that was always at a distant part of the airfield, and if you had to swing compasses, you'd get to taxi around in them and stuff, but uh, uh, we knew all the things to get it off the ground. That was part of my systems, you know, the engine systems and stuff. Uh, I doubt we ever could have got one back down, though. <laughs> that would have been a little bit tough. What would you say? were most of your, your problems that you encountered with them? A lot of autopilot system uh, problems, uh, just they needed adjustments, they would always get out of whack. Um, a lot of the engine instruments had to be changed around uh, pretty frequently, uh, lighting systems especially, and, and probably one of the biggest problems we had was the uh, fuel systems. Uh, registering properly they could they could get out of whack and of course you've got to know what you've got for fuel up there and uh, I, I remember one problem in particular we had with one aircraft where um, it would get up to altitude and be flying and all of a sudden the uh, the fuel gauges would just run to zero hmm. and uh, they knew they had fuel, but of course they didn't know if they had a leak or something else was going on. Mm -hmm. They had to bring that plane back, and we worked on that plane for close to a month, I think. Uh, it still flew when, once we realized it was uh, not a, actually a fuel s 
leak. Um, it shouldn't have. It was, technically, that was a down gripe, but we were also in a in a combat zone, and they needed aircraft, and we would work on it on sort of off hours uh, when they weren't flying it. Um, it was a, it was a it was a long haul. We want two of us, myself and, and another marine, uh, worked with a head tech rep on that plane for close to 30 days before we could find out what was wrong with it. And we uh, we check systems over and over and over again. Every every inch of wire, every connector. Um, pulled all the fuel probes out of the main tanks, everything, and we couldn't find it because we couldn't duplicate the gripe mm -hmm. on the ground. As soon as the plane would land, everything came back up to normal. Um, it happened at like 20,000 feet or something, and, and we would figure, uh, we, we used to actually have jacks for the plane, but we used to joke that, you know, unfortunately we didn't have any 20,000 foot jacks to, to get it up there. Um, and it turned out it was it was something that was caused by vibration in the aircraft, and of course as soon as it landed, the ground would absorb the excess vibration. Uh, and it was nothing but a, uh, a fuel probe that uh, was in one of the main tanks, and it ran between two wire tubes and with the vibration it would rub against those tubes and eventually it wore the coating off of the probe and it would short out. But it was nothing much more than a, uh, a scratch, a small scratch. Um, we finally, for like the third time, pulled the probes and we actually got a magnifying glass out and just, just went down the whole probe until we, we found this and said that's got to be it. And, Changed the probes out and it was fixed. But it was, uh, I'm sure it was not comfortable for the pilots, you know, when they would take that aircraft someplace because if, if you did get hit and have it a leak, you wouldn't necessarily know it. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I give them a lot of credit. They, we, we had some good pilots, some great pilots in, in uh, Bombardier Navigators, and uh, they were definitely mission oriented. Uh, uh, well, when did you go over to Vietnam? Uh, you, my unit deployed as a unit as in a unit. Uh, March of 1967. Um, that fact that when, when we first checked into uh, Cherry Point from the AE school, the mm -hmm. first question we were asked was, have you been to Vietnam yet? And uh, of course the answer was no, and, and the guy said, okay, you guys are going to VMA 533. They sent a bunch of us there because they were already, I guess, on the rolls to to go. They were firming up and training the people and, and they were designated to go and, and we did. We went in uh, March of 67, the whole unit packed up uh, two, C1, two or three C-141 star lifters of our personnel and equipment uh, and we went uh, from Cherry Point to Alaska to Japan and right into Chulai. Boom, boom, boom. All I did is stop to refuel. Um, we had 12 aircraft in the squadron. They left Cherry Point and did a cross-country flight, Hawaii and the Philippines, mm -hmm. you know, that bit, with uh, three C-130s. There was a lead C-130, um, and there was a tail 130 and another one that carried spare parts. And they would uh, sort of leapfrog and fix them as, as they went across country. And uh, we, we actually had, uh, it's in Marine, Marine Corps documents, one of the most successful uh, Transpacs uh, ever made. We arrived in Vietnam with 12 aircraft and an up status ready to go. Um, now how many were in your unit? I was counting in a cruise book the other day mm -hmm. and I think I came up with like just right around 300. Mm -hmm. you know, counting pilots, bombardier navigators and uh, all the support personnel. About 300 people. Mm -hmm. Now what was it like? What was your impression as soon as you got into July? <laughs> it was hot. I said we left in March. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it, from the East Coast in North Carolina with, uh, you know, fairly cool temperatures and, you know, almost a direct flight and we got off the plane and it was like 110, 120 degrees mm -hmm. and, and uh, it was very hot, um, very bright and sunny, confusing. I mean, we just landed at this airfield. We didn't know anything about it, where it was. Uh, it took me months, I think, to even realize that we were at the south end of the field. I kept thinking we were at the north end for some reason. And uh, yeah, there's no orientation there per se. Except, uh, the base was small by comparison, 
to uh, some place like Da Nang or mm -hmm. the airports down around Saigon. Now, was it an established uh, uh, Marine base at that time? Chu Lai was a Marine Air Base originally. Uh, the Marines, uh, I think they landed there in 1965. They actually came ashore mm -hmm. the old fashioned way and uh, built the base and, and, and scoped out the base and built mm -hmm. it. Uh, ironically, a friend of mine from high school who was a little bit older than, than myself uh, had gone into the Marines. Uh, and he was a forest recon uh, man, and uh, he was one of the ones that made the landing to set up the base that I would actually wind up at mm. a few years later. Uh, but it had a main airstrip, uh, full-fledged full airstrip. Uh, the initial airstrip was just one of the old uh, sats matting, uh, you know, the metal planking mm -hmm. that they used to put down. It was a very short airstrip, the original one. Um, and they flew A-4 Skyhawks out of that, and it was so short that the Skyhawks actually had to use the old JATO, the Jet Assisted Takeoff Bottles, uh, to take off. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I got there, they had a full, full-fledged runway and crosswinds runway in there, and uh, it was, you know, it was un in full operation. I mean, they had uh, Phantom outfits uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the north end of the field were all the fighters, at the south end of the field were all the attack aircraft. Which at that time really were all A4 Skyhawks. We were the only A6 intruder squadron at Chulai. And we had uh, a sister squadron up in uh, Da Nang, uh, VMA W242, the Bats, or the Batman, as they call themselves. Now, um, what were living conditions like there? Where did you stay? Um, your food, so on? When we first got there, we didn't have a place to stay. They weren't expecting us for some reason quite that early and the squadron we were replacing hadn't left, so we actually slept in a, uh, I call it an old grass hooch. It was a, a building they had set up for like recreation. It was the thatch grass with the roof and everything, and slab concrete floor, and we used to sleep in there on that until the other squadron left. And we'd go down in the daytime and, and work on developing our area where the hangar was going to be. Um, once we got into quarters, our quarters were, uh, the standard, what we call it standard, they were just plywood, uh, plywood hooches. Uh, they had a metal roof, uh, plywood sides with screening on, and uh, they were wide open inside. You just would put your people in there. And, and uh, initially we slept on cots. Later we kind of manufactured ourselves some bunk beds out of uh, scrap materials and stuff. Marines have always been good at uh, improvising, I guess they used to tell us. And, and we did a lot of that. Uh, scrounging parts and all the other things that had to be done. Uh, we did have a, a pretty good mess hall. Uh, it was limited, but uh, it was actually prepared food, at least at the air base. Mm -hmm. um, if you happened to catch a stint, uh, uh, an extra duty, as I did a couple of times, where you were with the, the group guard on the perimeter at nighttime or something, then out there you would either get sea rations or they would uh, bring out hot food in, in big tin canisters. So you had to serve uh, security also? Yeah, they, uh, the, we had, uh, I think there were two Marine Air Groups. I was in MAG-12, mm -hmm. which was the attack group. I, I'm not sure the number. The other one may have been MAG-13, uh, that was the fighter group. And m each Marine Air Group uh, was responsible for some perimeter control at nighttime. Um, the MAG-12 Air Group was made up of us handful of personnel from each squadron and the other part of it was made up of marine grunts that were being given a break in essence really they're being brought back maybe off the out of the bush someplace to uh, recuperate or be given a break and their duty would be to man that perimeter at night mm -hmm. with us and they've supplied the bulk of it and we supplied the additional uh, people and uh, it usually was a couple of weeks duty if you happen to draw that and uh, you went out at night and sat in bunkers, out on listening posts, uh, be on the wire. And, um, I usually was on a machine gun bunker, um, which rotated as a listening post, so we'd have a three-man team. Um, one would get a chance to sleep, one would be up on the top of the bunker with, the, with an M60 machine gun, and the third person would be out on a listening post, be on the wire. And we would rotate every few hours, so every man got a chance to to do each thing. Most of the other holes were two-man holes, mm -hmm. uh, machine guns for three and had the listening posts. 
I mean, that was an interesting time when you're used to the security of the, the air base itself, you know, sitting out on the perimeter after dark and being stuck on a listening post for, a, for an air wing personnel was, a, you know, a, a, a different experience. Was there ever any incidents or contact with the enemy? We never had any real kind of direct assaults. Our base was more prone to be occasionally mortared or, or rocketed, sometimes just for harassment fire, uh, and sometimes seriously. Uh, as I went over in '67, and I came, I uh, did a 13-month tour and a six-month extension, and so I was there for the Tet Offensive, and we we really got nailed on the the second night of the Tet Offensive. Uh, we lost our hangar. Uh, one of the people from my shop that I worked with constantly uh, had his arm taken off by a piece of shrapnel. Mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't lose any aircraft, uh, not even damaged. We uh, said it was the second night, and since we were expecting it on the second night, uh, we f flew our missions that day and then we evacuated the aircraft to uh, Thailand uh, after they completed their mission, so they weren't there at nighttime. They'd fly back in in the day, and we'd work on them, and they'd go out and fly their missions and go back to Thailand until we mm -hmm. felt secure there. Uh, we did have two aircraft on the ground that couldn't fly at the time, but uh, the revetments, uh, the steel revetments they have to protect them absorbed uh, any of the shrapnel that wound up in their direction, and uh, we were eventually able to get those planes back up and flying, too. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Tet Offensive, though it damaged I mean, it totally destroyed our hangar. It had to be rebuilt. It just came down. Uh, the last rocket of the night hit the bomb dump, which was right just beyond our area, and it set off a uh, huge sympathetic explosion. And it, it actually was the concussion from that explosion that, that ripped this steel girdered hangar right down to the ground. Um, damaged a couple more seriously enough that they had to be replaced for the other squadrons uh, down the line. Uh, the concussion was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. We were now, all when, when were most of the the um, flights by the intruders during the day or the night? Or I know they were all weather all day. Yeah, we, we flew around the clock, but mm -hmm. the serious missions usually were at nighttime. Um, just about every night we had aircraft going up to Hanoi and Haiphong and the Ho Chi Minh Trail and some of the real high risk uh, areas. Uh, lost a few crews. Uh, over the period, uh, but uh, overall, uh, for the number of missions we flew, uh, we did very well in that mm -hmm. that that area. Um, I know we had at least two airmen that were two crews that were or one crew that was lost, two man crew that was lost that uh, was returned as prisoners of war in 1973. Did uh, you know that crew personally? I I knew the. Uh, people, yeah. We were familiar mm -hmm. with most of the pilots and bombardier navigators. The uh, relationship between officers and enlisted men is always a little bit different in the air wing than it is in the, in the infantry because mm -hmm. uh, you see them a lot. There aren't as many of them and they're always in these air crews. You're working with them on the aircraft. And they also know that they're dependent on you to, uh, for their safety mm -hmm. you know, when they're flying. It, it's, uh, um, they did the, the risky part of the business as, as we looked at it and, and uh, have nothing but uh, admiration for those those crews. But as I said, it was a high maintenance plane and to keep those planes flying uh, was a lot of maintenance hours. Mm -hmm. How many hours would you say for a plane for each hour it was in the air, how much maintenance? Approximately. I I don't know exactly, but I say easily it's you know it's over a hundred hours of maintenance between the different shops mm -hmm. definitely because uh, there's just so many systems in there. I mean you, you you've got people working on injection seats, uh, you got metalsmiths working on the on the aircraft damage. You you've got uh, the ham support people working on computers uh, once they're drawn out of the plane uh, because mostly what we did was troubleshoot and locate things. Now in the electric shop. If it was a wiring problem, we would fix the wires and the connectors and stuff. But a lot of our equipment ran through uh, computers as well, air navigation computers and things like that. And if, if the problem is, was in there, we didn't fix those directly in the squadron. We just pulled the boxes and replaced them and sent the box out to our mm -hmm. ham support unit, which uh, would repair them and then get them, get, they would do the internal work and get them back to you. And uh, 
So we would do a lot of the troubleshooting uh, aspect of it. But but every year, ordinance people and just just to to load the bombs and, and stuff well, on that aircraft was a it was a big job because it would carry so many. Well, how l l large was the bomb load and standard? Could you show that sure. photograph? I guess that yeah. you could put that in now. This would uh, be an early version of an A6 intruder. Uh, early model, and that that's, that one's carrying 28 500 pound bombs, which would be a, a standard load for an intruder uh, if it was doing close air support okay. and uh, something like that. Now, if it was going up north, <clears throat> it would usually carry some drop tanks, so you would lose part of your load, but it could carry just about anything. I mean, 250 pound bombs, obviously 28 of those. Um, and we did carry those on occasion. Those were good for close air support because uh, uh, the shrapnel range was a little bit less if, and, and you didn't want to be hitting your own people. Uh, but the 250s and the 500s were very common. We could carry 750s. We carried 1,000 pounders, 2,000 pounders for, for busting up heavy complex uh, bunkers. Um, it, was a, it, was just called, it was called a heavy hauler. Uh, for a small two-man aircraft, there was nothing that could touch it and payload at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the next step up, we're getting up into the B-52s. Uh, and, uh, and it was an extremely uh, versatile aircraft and very, I said, very rugged. And, and the big thing was all weather. Uh, we could literally fly close air support in zero visibility. And all worked off a black box mm -hmm. situation. And, uh, forward air controller on the ground. If he had the proper black box, uh, you you could fly common ordinary close air support missions in in, in zero visibility and and be successful. Uh, in in the monsoon season, of course, that made us very very busy because lots of the other aircraft couldn't fly. Um, and, and especially for the land-based intruders, because as good as they were, a lot of times the, the Navy was the only other person that had the intruders, mm -hmm. and uh, there were times where they wouldn't, you know, launch them off the carriers. Uh, so we would, we would do an awful lot of work in the monsoon season. Uh, and that was tough because it, you get all that moisture out there now with, the, with the, all the electronics, and you, you start getting into some other problems. Mm -hmm. um, That's a question I was going to ask you, how they... The weather over there affected them. Yeah, I mean, making the maintenance a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't think it really ever slowed us down in terms of being able to carry out the missions. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't really affect the planes because the crews were trained to, you know, operate in all weather conditions. Mm -hmm. um, they were, because they are really Navy aircraft. They were all carrier capable. They all have the tail hooks and, and everything and. Uh, most marine airfields have a resting gear to practice on and for emergencies. We, we had one pilot that uh, had to make an emergency landing using a resting gear at, at the Chulai Air Base, mm -hmm. uh, and which he, he did successfully. Now, what do you mean by that? Um, <clears throat> drop the tail hook and catch a cable, just like you would see them doing on, on, a, on an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. um, he, had, he had actually made a landing uh, at nighttime, and as he landed, a uh, wheel strut came off the aircraft. He lost the left, or the port, mm -hmm. that we call it in the, at that time. And the, the port wheel just fell off the plane, and he got the plane back up in the air. And uh, they prepared the runway for uh, emergency landing, with the strung out the arresting gear, and he dumped his excess fuel, and came in for an approach and uh, the cable broke and he had to go up in the air again. Uh, and of course by now he'd already dumped a lot of his excess fuel so he's probably running on fuel as they got it ready but he came in the uh, th that last time and uh, made a textbook landing. Uh, I, I was there to watch that mm -hmm. uh, and he kept that plane perfectly level. All he had was a nose wheel and the right wheel, nothing on the left. Mm -hmm. Now this is that mm -hmm. captain you wrote about that? Th this would be Captain Souter. Okay, his amazing landing. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, that was uh, that was something. Uh, 
he was apparently a, a charmed pilot. I know he joined the squadron later. He did not go over with us initially. Mm -hmm. And uh, before he came to us, he had been involved in a mid-air collision back in the States and had to eject and survived. And my understanding was that after Vietnam, when he went back to the States, he was involved in another incident. Not his fault, but uh, mm -hmm. he had to eject again. <laughs> and, uh, so he, he was either, uh, I would just say he, he must have been a charmed pilot as well as a good one uh, to, to uh, walk away from two ejections in a crash. A pretty lucky one. Yeah, yeah pretty lucky. Yeah. Now you said you worked long hours. How many hours yeah, we, were we, you on? How many off? <coughs> we tended to work uh, a day shift and a night shift. I worked nights most of them. Uh, it usually was like a 12 hour shift. And um, theoretically, you worked seven days a week. They would give us time off. Uh, in pairs now and then when when things might slow down a little bit <clears throat> And so you'd usually work five six days a week, but they were 12-hour shifts um, Nighttime was quick maintenance. It was turnaround maintenance planes coming back getting ready to go out for another mission a lot of the the longer term uh, Maintenance would take place during the, the day shift uh, They would work on a lot of the what we would call the down gripes, which would uh, so the plane couldn't fly uh, we would work on a lot of the upgrapes at night. Something would come in, they uh, pilots would file it, and uh, we'd get right out on there and start working on the, especially the upgrapes, uh, to, so they could get back up in the air. If it was a downgrape that looked like it was fairly simple to do, then we'd go right after that as well. Uh, that might be, for example, something as simple as a landing light. Uh, a landing light on a night operation is uh, considered a downgrape, and. Uh, we did a lot of flying. Those, those, when those planes took a lot of impact, and it, uh, it's between us and the carriers, especially. And for some reason, they kept breaking these uh, landing lights in the front. And uh, I remember at one time, I think the squadron was down to two landing lights, but 12 aircraft. And so, to keep any plane flying, they had to have the landing light. And we would just cannibalize those two lights, one right. After the other. As soon as the plane landed, we'd run out and take the landing light out run over to the next plane, put the landing light in so he could fire up and take off. And uh, it was a simple thing, but it, it took a while. I mean, there were like, I don't know, 36, 40 screws in the cover of every landing light. And they didn't have the power drills today. They were the old uh, hand cranks, you know, like this with augers. And you'd have to get out there and we'd be taking them out of one plane. Somebody would be on the other one getting the lens off that. And we'd just run lights back and forth all night long just to keep things going because that was a downgrade. Mm -hmm. um, but again, a relatively simple one, so we could we could handle those at night. Um, we would get a lot of what I would call the turn-up gripes. Uh, the pilots would go out to get ready to go on a flight, turn the engines up, get their systems going, and all of a sudden there'd be a problem. Uh, the problem had to be fixed before the plane could go. and uh, It might be to uh, just change an instrument. Uh, it was not uncommon to be out there with the plane turned up and, and have somebody leaning into the cockpit changing an instrument out uh, while the pilot and the bombardier navigator sat there and you, you were changing it as quickly as you could so they could get get going because they had a time on target to deal with and everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a lot of that kind of stuff at night. It, it could be uh, it could be very boring on some nights uh, and it could be non-stop on others depending on what was going on. Uh, I always enjoyed the night shift, though, because you, you didn't lose sleep on that one. <clears throat> if the base ever got hit, it was always at nighttime. <clears throat> and uh, they would, uh, those of us that were working were already up and in the area, and, and we'd be all set. We'd go to our fighting holes or our bunkers, wherever it was called for. But they would always, after an attack, wake up the day crew and bring them down to the, to the area also in case something was up. And uh, they'd be the ones that would lose all the sleep. <clears throat> to come down to that. <coughs> we, we used to uh, uh, laugh. The base was, was fairly good sized, and, and for some reason, with, if we did get mortared or rocketed, they would always hit one end of the base first, and then there'd be a little bit of a lull while I guess they shifted their increments and their adjustment, and then they would hit the other end. And uh, of course, we had a warning siren, and, and once you realized the other end was getting hit, we would 
we'd be on our bunkers, but at them rather than in them and watching mm -hmm. the other end get hit. And as soon as it would stop, we'd all run into our bunkers and, and wait for it to start heading down our way. And it, inevitably it would. Mm -hmm. Or, or and, and I talked to some people from the other air group and they used to do, <laughs> do the same thing if we happened to get hit first. Or, or after it cleared at their end, they'd come out and check things out and then watch our end, you know, get hit. Um, now you said you were there approximately 19 months. Yeah. You know, how did you, what changes did you see take place over that period of time? Well, during that period, uh, there was a, a halt to the bombing up north for a while. And so our, our night missions cut back a little bit. And it was more of the close air support mm -hmm. and Ho Chi Minh trail type stuff. Um, that was, uh, without a doubt, a relief for the pilots and the, and the you know, the air crews, mm -hmm. I'm sure, because uh, Hanoi and Haiphong Harbor were pretty, pretty intense areas. Um, but they, they still did a lot of flighting, uh, a lot of uh, flying during those, uh, those periods. It just, it just shifted to another area. Uh, and, and, some, and from what I understand, the Ho Chi Minh Trail area could be pretty nasty, too. They uh, like to protect that. And uh, like I said, we, we lost a few crews. How many crews that time. did you lose practically um, while you were I there? I think in my, my tenure there, we, we lost uh, three air crews. Mm -hmm. Now, what were, where were they lost and, and how were they brought down? Do you know at all? Uh, the, first, the first crew we lost, we're not sure about. Mm -hmm. um, they went up on a mission up in the, I believe it was in the Haiphong area, and they just disappeared off radar. Um, and nothing, at that time, nothing was, was found. Um, I have done some research on the internet, especially afterwards, because you can look up unit histories and stuff, and, and actually I was on yesterday, mm -hmm. and uh, I found some information uh, on that incident and they they believe they found the wreckage uh, since then uh, and the claim was that the North Vietnamese shot the aircraft down but it was a, a high impact explosive situation and uh, uh, they weren't able to recover any remains or anything uh, that could be used for DNA uh, research but it was an intruder and uh, I don't know if they were able to match up part numbers or anything like that um, that was uh, Major Basic and Captain Boggs. Uh, they were they were the first crew we lost, and, and that was a blow to the squadron because we had been, you know, we'd been doing well, flying a lot of missions, and the planes kept coming back. And you know, I guess you knew in your heart it probably couldn't last, but uh, it, uh, you know, that, that hit everybody pretty hard when that one went down. Um, and I said they recovered a crew at the end of the war. Um, the two, uh, I, I did meet, uh, actually through your museum, uh, a bombardier navigator that uh, was over there with me. David Benno. David Benno. Who we interviewed, yes. Yeah, and uh, he had some information on the people that had, had been uh, prisoners of war and, and mm -hmm. stuff. And, uh, uh, we had a good talk. It was kind of nice to get now, together. Did you remember him at, from when, when I first there? saw his photo in the museum? Uh, he kind of looked familiar, but I I wasn't 100 percent positive. I mm -hmm. think partly because the angle that that picture was taken at made him look like he was six feet tall or something, and, and I I didn't remember anybody that tall, and he isn't. I mean, he, he's approximately right. my height. Yeah. And uh, but when I got together with him into uh, to have lunch, uh, as soon as he got out of his vehicle, I knew who it was. And, and I mean, I didn't know much about him, I just remembered him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had a nice talk, a couple hours at lunch that day. And he was the first person I've seen face to face in, in about 38 years that was from my unit. I've talked to a couple in email, but he's the first one I've actually been, been back with. There was one, one guy I worked with that uh, I saw, I went to his wedding a couple of years after I was out of the Marines, uh, but since then I hadn't uh, seen anybody face to face. And now, were there any persons that stood out 
why you were in the service that you recall? Yeah, I, I uh, an impression on you. I, I, I was. Uh, I really liked our first commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Brown. His name was. He he was just what you would want, I guess. He was uh, he was strict when he had to be, but he was he was a down to earth person. Uh, wasn't wasn't beyond uh, joking and fooling around with mm -hmm. the, some of the enlisted men. I I remember when I first joined the squadron, we used to uh, kind of play games on the on the new people. And uh, they would they would get somebody, for example, and send them down to the uh, transport unit and tell them they needed uh, five five uh, five gallons of prop wash or something like that, or uh, send somebody to a squadron and tell them to get them 500 feet of flight line. And uh, I remember one incident where uh, the colonel was out in the plane. He was just he just got in his intruder. This was still at Cherry Point before we deployed, and there was a, a new guy there and. All of a sudden, the colonel kind of signals him to come out of the cockpit, and uh, the guy rushes up there. He's man, the CO, you know, it's, it's, I mean, the guy can, this is great, and he says, uh, "You know, I can't get this thing started. I forgot the keys. Would you go into the office and get them?" And the guy runs in, of course, and there's no keys to start an intruder, <laughs> and everybody, that, and the flight line gave the guy a set of keys. <laughs> He brings them back out, takes them up, and gives them to the colonel. He probably went home thinking he's going to get a promotion out of this or something. I don't know. But I mean, he wasn't beyond that. He, he was. You knew he was the colonel, mm -hmm. but he was just pleasant to be around, uh, and he didn't interfere. He let things go. Um, and obviously, everybody is pretty much proud of the unit mm -hmm. that they served with. But uh, 533 was was truly a, a special unit. Um, uh, David Benna had flown with several A6 units, and, and he said the same thing. He said that that squadron had its act together. Um, oh, many awards are given after the fact. Um, in VMA 533, in uh, 19 for the period of 1967 to 1969, was given the uh, Commandant's. Uh, Aviation Efficiency Award. In that two-year period, all in Vietnam, they flew over 10,000 sorties, yeah. which which is just huge. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to keep records of the uh, the missions that the planes had flown by putting a little bomb, uh, you know, a painted bomb on the side of the aircraft, and we'd have aircraft with like four and five rows of ten. On there, and, and and people would say, "What's each bomb is a mission?" So now each bomb is ten missions. So they, you know, they did a ten thousand sorties, and and the, a sortie may involve more than one aircraft. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's just a mission, and some were a lot of them were one aircraft missions, and a lot of them were multiple. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that two year period, they had over ten thousand combat sorties in in Vietnam. Uh, I said we had one of the most successful trans. Trans packs uh, that's ever been made. Uh, it was it was it was a very very good unit, and, and I think like I said I extended for six months, but I was far from the only person that did that in that squadron. Uh, I don't know what the percentage was, but but I've often said it was tw somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the people probably extended six months uh, with that unit. Did you have much contact with local people at all? We supported an orphanage in one of the, the villages off base, uh, but I spent most of my time right at the base. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, there, there were Vietnamese on the base. Mm -hmm. they, they did a lot of the, the jobs on the base. Uh, but uh, other than trips out to the orphanage and stuff, my, myself personally, I didn't have a lot of contact with them. Uh, and, and my travels in Vietnam were limited. I think the only places I ever really went were Chu Lai. And uh, I did go up to Da Nang, but only to uh, uh, to travel home. And when I went on R&R, &R, you know, where did you go, go for R&R? &R? Uh, I went to uh, Bangkok and Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, I went there twice. I went there once on my initial 13-month tour, and I went back uh, on my six-month extension. I, I went back to Bangkok. Uh, I liked it there. It was it was it was a really nice place, especially for a for a young guy, and, and you you're coming out of where you were. You know, it was it was different bathtubs and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we had a 
Uh, we had basically a pretty good base where I worked, but uh, there certainly weren't any bathtubs, and uh, we did have a, a big, huge community shower, which was nothing but water pipes running with, uh, you know, outlets off of them. Mm -hmm. And in a lot for for quite a while, it was just cold water. Uh, eventually, we got like a water buffalo in there that they had a burner under, and you could actually get some hot water. But uh, for a, for an air base, it was probably relatively relatively primitive compared to some place like Benang or the ones down around Saigon. Um, that did change. Um, so Chu Lai, when I went there, was it a, a Marine Air Base? But it uh, it also eventually, uh, during my stay, turned into the headquarters for AmeriCal Division from the Army. And when they came in, uh, things got a little bit better supply-wise around the base and stuff. Um, the old SATS matting runway that the A4s used to use was still there, and that became a, a helicopter area in the Army. And the, I, there, probably were, there were a few Air Force choppers there, I think, too, that they used for carrying out the uh, Miracal division. Um, night Miracal arrived was, was, was another night that we got hit heavy. Uh, they, were, they were coming in by the plane load and uh, of course the, the enemy knew that. And housing again was a problem. They were putting them up in a, one of the A4 squadrons had left and there was a vacant area right next to ours actually. Um, with all the steel revetments, and they were they were they were housing their people uh, in between those revetments on cots for the first night or two, and uh, actually for the first night only, as it turned out, because they got nailed, they 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 got mortared very heavily that night, and uh, they lost a few people right there the very first night they were there, and had a bunch wounded. You know, numbers fly around, but the, the number flying around was a hundred casualties. And that wouldn't surprise me because there were, there were a lot of them coming in, and they were on concrete. And so when the mortars hit the concrete, there was no place for the shrapnel to go but out. You know, if they'd been out in the sand, that would probably absorb some of it. But they weren't. They were where they were. And, uh, that was probably the first time really the base got heavily hit. Mm -hmm. That when I was there, uh, they really poured. They really poured some mortar fire in on that that group. Now, when did you leave Vietnam? Let's see, it would have been 69, been there in the end of 69, probably October or November of 69. <clears throat> and then I went back to Cherry Point, uh, where I joined uh, another A6 squadron, uh, VMAW, uh, or VMAAW 121, the Green Knights. And, and, and that was interesting, too. I checked into a squadron that had no airplanes. <laughs> they were, we had absolutely no aircraft. They were converting from A4s to A6s. And uh, myself and another guy that came back, we checked in the same day. We'd both been in 533 together. And we checked in, and instead of, have you been to Vietnam yet, they said to us, Brown and Hunt, why are those names familiar? <laughs> Come on there, we're in trouble again. We just got here. And, and what it was was that the uh, the the man that was in charge of the electric shop for 121 had been our staff sergeant in charge of the shop in Vietnam, who came home after the first tour, mm -hmm. and he requested us. He said, "When these two guys come back, I want them in my unit." Mm -hmm. And so we went to 121 and uh, helped them convert to A6s, and. Uh, we slowly began to get aircraft. By the time I left, we still didn't have a full squadron, but we were up, I think, to six or eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were getting more flight hours out of our six and eight aircraft than the full-fledged 12, 12 aircraft squadrons were getting. Uh, we were actually borrowing fuel from other squadrons because fuel was at a limit stateside because everything was going overseas. And uh, we were getting more flight time out of our six and eight aircraft than the 12-man squadrons were. And at the same time, training new, new people. Mm -hmm. uh, I was put in charge of a, of a night crew. Uh, I was promoted to sergeant and put in, in charge of a night crew to help train people uh, who would be deploying to other squadrons.
Now you did this until you were discharged? I did that until I discharged. Until you were discharged? Um, I was due to get out in October of 69, but I got out at the end of August. Um, I had a, an early out to go to college. Um, once you could uh, show that you'd been accepted at a college, if you were in a certain time frame, they would let you out early. <clears throat> So you could get home, get things straightened out in time to go to school. Now yeah. you use the GI Bill for that? Uh, for what it was worth, yeah, I, <laughs> I used that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only, I think it was $120 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, you couldn't even credit that towards your tuition. Mm -hmm. um, now where, where did you go to school? I went to uh, Adirondack Community College in Glens Falls for two years. Then yeah. I went down to Oneonta. Did you find any problems being a Vietnam veteran coming home? It, it, traditionally, I mean, there was the, the no welcome home mm -hmm. thing, but I, I can't say that I was, was maltreated in any way when I came home. Um, and it was a community college. Um, I fit in pretty well, except you know I'm five, six years older than, mm -hmm. than the people in my freshman class. Uh, I didn't really mention or make any big deal out of having been to Vietnam, and, and other than maybe a few people from my own high school that were going to ACC, nobody really knew that. But uh, I do always recall that uh, when I was there, uh, that's when Kent State occurred. Mm -hmm. And that's when the invasion of Cambodia occurred, mm -hmm. and and they uh, became hot issues, obviously, on, on a campus. Uh, in fact, I, I had to do a speech course that year, and, and I did my speech on Kent State, what had happened there. And ACC, like many of the other campuses, uh, had a protest march, et cetera, and they were uh, going to do that and had a big meeting in the in the gymnasium and the, not the gym, but where the stage is, their theater, I guess, to kind of organize something like that. And, and, and I, I remember saying at the time that uh, I, could, I could very willingly march about what happened at Kent State, mm -hmm. but that I, uh, I couldn't march about going into the invasion of Cambodia. Uh, that was, of course, had always been a a safe haven, mm -hmm. and uh, attacks would be launched out of there down south and and stuff. And it, it, you know, I, I really generally believe that you needed to root those people out of there. And uh, and the president had also set a deadline on that. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, give that a chance to happen because if you if he doesn't do what he says he's going to do, then you can impeach him. Mm -hmm. You know, but but I believed in. Even though I'm sure there were a lot of political things behind that, from a military point of view, that made sense to me. And, and uh, I may have been back here, but I still had a lot of friends that were over there. And uh, I just didn't, uh, I, I couldn't do that part of it. So I marched halfway and got out. <laughs> I actually did. I, I marched halfway down the, the route and um, said to my friends, I said, I'm getting out now. I said. I did my half for Kent State. I'm, I'm not going to march against Cambodia. How do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? I would look at it as positive. I mean, I, I don't think anybody can, can go through the military period, let go through the military in a time of war. And, and, and if you survive, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to have some extremely valuable lessons. Um, I was watching an interview of this type on TV with a World War II Marine, and he said, you know, they taught me discipline. Uh, they definitely do that, and, and I think it's a discipline that, uh, that you carry with you always and, and, and that really pays off. Um, it becomes part of you. The, the, the old saying, of once a Marine, always a Marine, and I, you, you just, you can't get that out of your system. It, it remains part of you always. Uh, to this day, I go out on November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday, and and I have toast, even if I go alone. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the last couple of years, it's been a sailor that's gone with me. Is it okay for a sailor to take a Marine out and buy him a drink on the Marine Corps birthday? And uh, I go, yeah, it's okay, Doc. Right, we go out. Mm -hmm. Could you that's show us the photographs you'd have? Sure. Um, 
these all would have been taken around uh, 1967, 1968 at July. Um, the first three I'll put up are just uh, their uh, living area scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're pictures of me, but you can you can get an idea of what the uh, those hooches I was talking about mm -hmm. look like. You can see kind of the plywood and the screens and and stuff in the background. Uh, these are all quite similar. On this one you can see the flaps protruding. Uh, uh, to cut down on ventilation and keep rain out in the monsoons, they, they had these big full sheet plywood flaps and they just hold them up with a stick. And uh, But when you put them all up, you had screening all the way around so whatever breeze there was could uh, could go right through the areas. But Chulai too uh, was built really it's on sand. There's nothing jungle about it. And in the background in this you can see some pallets laying on the ground and, and that's what we use for sidewalks. Uh, we would take old pallets that came in, that equipment came in on and we'd scrounge them and we'd lay them out in sidewalks so you didn't walk in the sand all the time. Um, one of the nice things about that base was uh, it was right on the South China Sea and uh, less than a hundred yards from our living area was was the beach and uh, we could go down there every day and uh, you could go swimming and when the weather was good. Uh, this would have been the, a picture from the, uh, when I did group guard uh, period. I got an M60 machine gun there. Uh, on that particular day, we had been out in the daytime rather than at night. Uh, we did a, what was called an EOD run, explosive ordnance disposal. They would take truckloads of uh, truckloads of dud bombs uh, out into an area off the base, obviously, and. Uh, they would uh, have a big hole and they'd put all these bombs in there and, and then destroy them so the enemy couldn't get them. And uh, we would have to set up a perimeter guard. And on that particular day, uh, that I was on an M60 uh, for perimeter guard. And then the, the last photo I have is X. This is one of me working up in the wheel well of an A6. Uh, just fixing a, a switch that had to do with the landing gear doors so they would know things were closed and everything was uptight. Uh, we'd be in positions like that. Uh, as Navy aircraft, the wings folded, you know, up, mm -hmm. and we'd have to uh, fix lights up on the tips of the wings. And we'd be up on the wing tips and we'd be uh, way back in the tail. And uh, there's a lot of internal components in that. Uh, claustrophobic was not one thing you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those uh, systems had, uh, like, like the airspeed system uh, and altitude systems had lines uh, that could accumulate water and they would have to be drained. Well, they were way back in the tiny point of the tail and I was, you couldn't tell it now, but back then I was one of the guys small enough to be able to crawl back in there and it was like being in a little cave or a tunnel. You could hardly move and you, you, your arms are all scrunched up and you're working with wrenches. And, mm -hmm. uh, the same with the instruments. There were times where you'd be, I remember being like working on my car at home where I'd I'd have my feet up over the back of the seat and you're working up under the dashboard. Well, that's exactly the way the, the intruder was with some of those instrument systems. Uh, you'd have your back on the ejection seat and your head and arms up behind the instrument panel trying to get wiring and stuff off the back of the instruments. Uh, got caught in there once or twice during mortar attacks uh, upside down in the cockpit. Somebody would knock on the cockpit and you'd pull your head out and all of a sudden you'd see lights flashing and you, and you knew there was incoming. And you, to get out of the intruder when it was sitting there uh, without hydraulic pressure, the only way you could get out of that cockpit was to hand pump the cockpit open. It'd take about 80 pumps to get the cockpit open enough to get out. And uh, you'd be surprised how fast you can pump when, when, uh, when you can hear thumping in the background as those motors are going off and you can see them in the mirrors of the aircraft walking down the runway. You could get out in a real hurry. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome.